Welcome to the show today. In our continuing conversations with Michael McKibben and myself, Douglas Gabriel, about basically demons. We've been doing a discussion about uh, an interview with an exorcist, but then it turned into what people really were asking for, that Michael would ask the kind of questions that the, all of you out there listening would ask an exorcist if you had the opportunity, because a person like myself, we take a lot of things for granted. We just make statements and people assume people understand them, but they don't understand them because, you know, they don't have the perspective uh, that a person that was born clairvoyant, clairaudient, clairsentient has. So these are great conversations. People love these and they love you more than they love me, but that's okay. I'm not jealous. So you have oh. questions, which I call stump the chump. I'm the chump. I want you to stump me. I, I've got, so I'll see if I can stump the chump today. Oh, that'd be great. But you're not a chump. That's just a joke. Okay, Douglas, here's the here's the uh, uh, evolution of the thinking on this subject that I'd like to go through with you. And it deals with, I guess, two opposite ends of looking at this problem that we're talking about with demons and demon possession and how demons interact with humanity. And one is at the macro level, which more and more people are talking about now in that we're seeing a lot of these uh, this craziness uh, that exists in the political environment, the uh, geopolitical realm uh, as demon possession. So that we're seeing that these activities and these agendas uh, are being pressed by something that's above human because human beings uh, are born, grow up and eventually they die. And yet these strategies that we've been uh, identifying over the millennia uh, and certainly many centuries back uh, supersede what a human being could even think of controlling uh, because they eventually die. And okay, they may pass on some of those strategies to their children and we've seen a lot of that but this is way beyond that we're, we're talking about demon possession here and as we have identified we're talking about the demon the babylonian demons including mammon and lucifer and araman and baal and moloch and some of these things that we first identified uh, empirically in watching these elite peoples um <clears throat> engage in what has to be called witchcraft uh, and certainly demon possession. And now and on the other side of that is us as individuals, how do we interact with demons if we do? And how do we invite demons into our life? And what can we do as strategies going forward to um, make our lives more pure so we get rid of these demons? And so one of my questions is, related to an observation that I made way back, I would say about 2000, 2001, as we watched many of the bankers in especially Silicon Valley, but also New York, begin to invest in several market segments, which seemed crazy to me, but we saw, we see, we saw billions of dollars invested into gaming and coupons in addition to the technologies like, like we invented. And that never made sense to me as an engineer, because why would you, as a respectable banker, uh, <clears throat> invest billions of dollars into games? Uh, because the problem is you're attracting mainly young people into these environments that you're funding. Uh, and why are you doing that? Why are you putting so much emphasis on that? And then the other one was couponing. Now, that may seem stupid, but and it did seem stupid to me. Why, why are you investing in Groupon and in all these uh, uh, ways of saving money? Well, in our research, we've begun to identify mammon and usury as two key elements of this demonic attack on humanity. And so all of a sudden, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, I started putting that experience in the past together with this and realized that perhaps with couponing and gaming especially, we're seeing more to this strategy than it seems on the surface. 
And so when you have talked before about the fact that a demon cannot enter your life unless you invite them in. And since we're seeing so much demonic activity, the the natural question is, well, when did they invite them in? And uh, changing the subject slightly, uh, any parent uh, uh, over the last 20 or 30 years certainly recognizes the the overwhelming influence that gaming has on their child. Now, my kids started uh, using computers for gaming way back in Mario Brothers days, and that seems very simple now. But uh, my youngest son uh, was into more of these 3D games, uh, World of Warcraft and things like this. And what we all notice is that these people get mesmerized by the game and can sit there for hours on end. They stop playing outside. They, they stopped befriending people. They stopped wanting to go places because they're just hooked on these games. And so uh, I want to ask you, um, you've made general comments about the effect of gaming and technology on a person's psyche. Can you tell us more into how gaming could be a gateway drug of sorts, could be the way that so much of humanity is inviting demons into their lives? Yes, I can. Uh, there are two demons that we should work with uh, right now, and that's the one that pulls you out of your body, Lucifer, and the one that pulls you into your body and down into the realms below the terrestrial realms. And that is Araman, as Rudolf Steiner calls him, the old Persian name. We could call him Satan. We could call him Mephistopheles. We could call him Baal. We could call him basically the lord of this world, the, the lord of the underworld, actually. And then there's the Lord of the Upper Worlds. So a coupon, what is that? Well, let's just look at a bank. A bank tells you, you put money in, in the bank, we're going to give you money for putting money in the bank. That's a coupon. That's a reward for doing nothing. That's where you take money and uh, your attention, your, uh, your human attention, what you put your attention on is the basically the same thing. It is your willpower and it is your wealth. It is your treasure. So... When you put money in a bank and they give you an interest rate, it used to be a decent rate, now it's next to nothing. But what, what was that about? That is a total Luciferic illusion that you made money from money by doing nothing with your own willpower. So when you are being simply watching a movie, you are going into a Luciferic realm. Well, let me ask you, you're using banking and couponing and banking. Um, and you say we're getting something for nothing. No, we put the money, we put our hard earned money in and there was a coupon based on that money that we got a little bit more. Um, why would you say that I didn't do anything since that was my principle that I put there? The basis of evil in the economic realm is using money to make money, though you put no extra willpower into it. I mean, sure, you, you, you put your money in the bank, so you handed it to them and then right. you get four or five percent on that no that's pure evil that's basically saying that money can make money well money doesn't make money money mm -hmm. is a representation of human willpower so whether it's a coupon whether it's the reward you get playing a, a video game and by the way those rewards when you get those cause adrenaline rushes to your in your body from your adrenal glands cortisol is released in the brain uh uh, you get an epinephrine rush. You get a uh, basically a dopamine rush. So technically, when you are literally getting the rewards, whether it was from watching a, a video that you got fascinated with and never get fascinated, if you're fascinated, you're being held in the possession of a demon. Uh, and when you're hypnotized or mesmerized, a demon is holding your attention, holding your willpower, stealing it, sucking it away from you. So when you're given something for nothing, and basically, what is a video game? It's really nothing. Absolutely it's an illusion. Nothing. It's nothing. But it's stealing your willpower. Yeah, I often joke with, with uh, my kids. Well, when they say they, they achieve some uh, event on these games, I say, good, put that on your resume. <laughs> Precisely. What good is it going to do you? Now, people will say, 
oh, well, you know, but in the military, they now controlled drones with uh, young men who were very good at video games, at okay. killing, at killing. And we'll get to that one next. So one of these things sucks you out of your body. Now, can I stop you a second? Because mm -hmm. you use couponing related to interest in banking. Uh, I was thinking of another area of couponing, and that is, remember back in the old days when our parents would um, uh, save up these books of SNH green stamps, um, and and you know, get a big stack of them, and eventually you could go out and, and buy a grill with it. Um, but you spent a lot of time and energy building that book in order to get there. So somebody had our attention even back in the paper days before digits. That is a luciferic trick. They first off charged you, overcharged you. Then they give you stamps to represent the, what they stole from you. And then you put them in a book and then you can supposedly get something for free. You didn't get anything for free. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the American system of mortgages. They tell you that a bank is going to give you a loan. Bank does not give you a loan. The bank doesn't come up with any money. The bank takes your money you put down. And then they charge you three times the price if you got a 30-year mortgage, twice the price at least for a house. They never tell you that. It's, it's in the fine print when you sign it. But what do you think you're getting? You think you're getting something for nothing. You think that all you have to do is get the bank to give you a loan. First off, the bank doesn't give you a loan. The bank doesn't have that money. The bank never has that money. That's a lie. That's a luciferic so lie. So you're saying this is a luciferic deception. And why specifically luciferic and not demonic in general? Well, Lucifer, we have to go back to the story of Lucifer being uh, cast out of heaven by Michael and Michael's sword or Michael's Lucifer spear. Lucifer was, a, was, a, was an angel, right? The highest of angels. Right. One could literally call him the brother of Michael and Gabriel. Matter mm -hmm. of fact, the Bible insinuates he was the highest of all angels. And he did what? He had too much pride, too much hubris. He wanted the power that this very... Um, the image they give us is a seeing eye sitting on the throne that is so brilliant that no one can look upon it. Well, Lucifer wanted to look upon the eye of God and wanted to have that type of light. But in the end, Lucifer was kicked out of heaven, fell down into the darkness, and, well, even before that, gathered up all the material substance that he could, compounded it into the stones that were put in his crown. And these stones were supposed to glow so magnificently that they would rival the brilliant seeing eye of God. But Michael struck that stone, the, the central stone from the crown of Lucifer, and that is called the Holy Grail, Lucifer's Grail, and it fell to the earth, and Lucifer fell behind it. Well, Lucifer, if it wasn't for Lucifer, we would, Lucifer is a fallen being, all beings in the hierarchy have the opportunity to either advance with the progressive advancement of that is part of spiritual evolution, or they can stay back. They can be, as Rudolf Steiner calls them, retarded. They can be, they can slow down. They can try to stay where they were before, not advance, and then have certain powers over other beings that were below them. And that's what it's all about. Power over other beings. That's what Lucifer wanted. He wanted everyone to worship him. Well, we would not even see the world if it wasn't for Lucifer's fall. Color is light that is suffering and falling into matter. Lucifer was light, effulgent light, not radiant light, effulgent light that fell into matter. And what happens then? Lucifer can grab you for instance, Rudolf Steiner points out that when you're in a museum and you're looking at a very beautiful painting and you become fascinated by it, in other words, you say, I can't understand how it could be so beautiful. At that moment, spider demonic beings are crawling in and out of your eyes. Why? Because you have surrendered yourself to fascination. You no longer are controlling your I am. You're no longer controlling your own willpower. You're giving your willpower over to something that you think is so beautiful that you have surrendered yourself unto it. The second you do that, the luciferic beings will come in. Now, that's one end so of when it. You say, when you say luciferic beings, do you mean demons? Oh, they're demons, absolutely. Okay. So now, that, that means the same thing as a demon. A demon is coming into you. Yes. And as you've pointed out, you now notice in all of your religious uh, presentations at church 
that they're constantly talking about demons. Absolutely. Yes, constantly. Because why? You're on on the left hand. You're having Lucifer whisper into your left ear, and Araman, Satan, the being of the earth who lives underneath the earth, is whispering in your right ear. Now that's a little bit different. Lucifer will take your fascination and pull you out of your body and basically tell you everything is beautiful. Let's go up to the seventh heaven or the ninth heaven and and imbibe that beautiful experience. But if you have no morality or if you don't have enough morality, you won't even remember the experience. So taking drugs, psychotropic drugs and all kinds of drugs uh, that will make you feel euphoric, uh, basically mimicking the dopamine in your body that happens naturally, those are the ones that pull you out of your body. And it doesn't do you any good to go out of your body. And even if you went into the spiritual world and saw spiritual beings, because you wouldn't remember it later. I have Same to thing. ask you something. Uh, I don't have a, my camera doesn't work. Uh, Jamie Dimon really is Jamie Demon. He's hiding his name. Michael just pointed that out. And I said, oh, yes. I didn't hear him do that. No, no. Oh. Earlier when we were on the phone, he said, Jamie Dimon, you know, I, I think of demon. Yes. Absolutely. Well, not only think of in some ancestry records, it's spelled D-E-M-A-N. Well, he's the incarnation. He's a banker. Well, look what's happened in the banking industry. Yes. Now, a daemon, D-A-E-M-O-N or A-N, the Greek Socrates daemon, is your conscience. In those days, it was called the Furies or the Eumenides. And they would chase you. Three women with wings would chase you anytime you did something bad. So Socrates would say, when I come to a fork in the road, and I say, I'm going to go to the right. If it's the wrong choice, my daemon will speak to me and say, that's wrong. The daemon will not tell him what's right, but the daemon will tell him what's wrong. And that's what your conscience does. It tells you when you're doing something wrong. And if you develop your conscience, not consciousness, conscience, that is really God on earth acting through you. And that's what Lucifer doesn't have. He doesn't have a conscience, and neither does, especially neither does Araman, Mephistopheles, Satan. They don't have a conscience because they don't care about love. They simply want to steal from you. They are thieves in the night. And so on your left ear is Lucifer, on your right ear is Araman or Satan, but in your heart is Christ. And if Christ sits on the throne of your heart, neither one of those beings can have any power over you. For instance, let's say you're looking at a beautiful picture Instead of going all gaga and your eyes get all big and you get fascinated with the incredible skill of the artist, which really, it's not the skill of the artist. You're looking at the inspiration of an archangel. That's what you're looking at with a beautiful picture. That artist has developed discipline, has developed a devotion, dedication, and over time has tapped into the spiritual world and has become inspired. Or so you can also see terrible art, which is uh, just the imagination of the artist. But there's also an imaginal world of the angels that sometimes when you look at a painting or you look at a picture and you, you say, oh, my gosh, the angels are speaking through it. Yes, they are. Now, what you need to do is just like when you turn on the light and you get light in your room through electricity, you should thank the angels that fell into the electromagnetic sinkhole that has pulled them out of the celestial spheres into the earthly spheres to be a slave for a while. And then they're freed up, of course, once they um, have done their duty uh, for bringing that electrical impulse into human service. So when you are using a machine, when you're using a, playing a video game, you have gone below the realm of the earth. You've gone into hell. You're in a virtual hell. And it is eating you alive. And this is now quite known. The more time you spend on your phone or your computer, the more likely you will become um, depressed and suicidal. Well, let me, let me, if I could have you address a specific circumstance, because last, last week I told you I was watching some TV show and all of a sudden there was this really violent uh scene of an army and um uh, probably in the span of 10 minutes uh, 100 people died right on the screen 
And, and I recalled what you had been saying about, the, is this a point when somebody, if they don't do something in their heads, in their spirit, uh, could allow a demon to come into their lives because they've just watched 100 people be murdered. Now, we all argue in our minds, well, that's just f- fiction, that's just fantasy. But is it really? Because what we see among kids who watch this kind of stuff over time is some of them become serial killers. So what's yes. going on there? War is created by demons. They use humans, and they usually give them luciferic coupons, luciferic uh, enticements, so that they think that the war they can benefit from. But the reality is, all these things you see on television or in video games, if it goes back to, say, World of World War One, World War II, real people died then. So when right. you're watching a video of... A, a real life video of World War One and Two. Right. If you don't start crying, you don't have a conscience. If you see the films made of the concentration camps in not in Germany, and you don't fall to the ground crying, then you have no conscience. So if you're playing a video game where you are murdering hundreds and thousands of people, or That's you what watch the, the, those war, World of Warcrafts are, you're just going around shooting people. Period. And gaining gaining points. And most su- your points. And most superheroes have no conscience. They supposedly are acting out of morality when they kill the enemy. But who is the enemy? The enemy is just a part of yourself that you've rejected. So when you're in a video game and you're killing people left and right, you're no longer on the face of the earth and you're no longer human. You have been pulled into a mesmerizing, hypnotizing, and it literally does hypnotize you. The flashes on the screen the refresh um, frequency of the, the screen, rate. the refresh rate is a frequency and the colors are frequencies. And if you flash them in a certain order, uh, Japanese games have been known uh, that many of them have had to be pulled from the market because they, they do that on purpose so that you get high from it. High, it, li- mean, uh, it does dopamine. Uh, totally. Okay. You get basically like running up heroin. Video game is basically equivalent to running heroin, where your eye is diminished, your conscience is diminished, you are no longer social, and if you thought about it long enough, you would later, you become what? You become depressed and suicidal if you can't get the fix. So that's what happens with children. No child should have a cell phone. No child should be playing any video games because you are going into the virtual realm of Satan. And when you do, I always call it the demons in the black box. That's what we are dealing with. This is no joke. And uh, we have done intelligence reports on this showing the damage that these uh, electrical, uh, electronic devices do and showing you the statistics of the longer you are on them, the more it actually steals your ability to see color. So here you are watching a fantastic movie with uh, computer graphic imaging that is just amazing where the whole time you're fascinated and you're going, how do they do that? How can they do that? Look at all those alien characters. Oh, they're all so interesting. Oh, 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 I can't take it all in. You're not taking it all in. You're hypnotized. It's going in whether you like it or not. Same thing with a video game. You may say, oh, I'm not really killing people. Yes, you are. In your Hmm. imagination, you are killing people. So don't think you can get away from it. Don't think that you can get away from the furies that should be chasing you when you see one of these movies. I started, I saw a a trailer for a John Wick uh, movie. The entire thing is killing from beginning to end. You cannot count all the people that he kills. And what is this? Well, they would call it, well, this is okay because this is a superhero. This is uh, this is uh, a Bruce Lee. This is the Green Hornet and Cato, his his uh, driver. And you know, uh, it's it just like with the Lone Ranger. The Lone Ranger would always use his gun to shoot the gun out of the hand of the other person. But when it came down to the bottom line, it was Tonto's knife that usually won the day because he would throw the knife and he would kill somebody. So they can try to make it a little less obvious. But when it comes down to it, it's the same thing as what Rudolf Steiner pointed out. In about 1840, materialism fell from the spiritual world 
and had to be kicked out again. It was like a Luciferic rebellion, but this time it it was materialism. It was the delusion, the illusion that physical matter is all there is. There's nothing spiritual. There's no soul. There's nothing other than that. And it fell down to the earth. And then we started, of course, we had printing. He literally says each of those skeletal pictograms is a demon. Because why? You, you read these individual sounds, these individual sound bites, these vowels and consonants. You put them together and then you put them in a sentence. And when you read the sentence, it is supposed to, inside of you, solicit image making so that your own imagination will create what it is that's being described with the words. Well, that's not the way it happens anymore. People don't read first off. So but, can I stop you there? Are you saying that that the printed word uh, is also um, somehow bad? Is that what it's you're saying? It's demonic. It's demonic. It is so, so Where you? I'm not sure what you're saying there, because uh, that's the way we learn. No, it's not. The way we learn, that's the way you self learn. But even that is just rote. That's called read write. The way you learn okay. is by hearing another person speak from their soul, demonstrating that they have a spirit. The only thing that a teacher can teach is who they are, period. When you are learning how to type, it is an arbitrary set of finger movements that try to replicate speech. So in the old days, in Hammurabi's day, they had what was called votive stones. Right. And the same thing with Egypt. No one was allowed to go up and read what's on the columns or on the stone silently. That's demonic. Why? Well, because I, you may probably misunderstand what it is that's written there. I venture to guess that no one in history has ever uh, talked about the Gutenberg press in the way you're talking about. Correct. Except for Rudolf Steiner. Wow. Wow. But it's the truth. Think of it. When you are reading the dead pictograms of, say, Fichte or Goethe, do you think you understand what Goethe, what, what you would have gotten had you heard Goethe speak those words? Yeah, but he's gone. So uh, how else are we going to get it? They put it in a play. They put it on stage. They add music. They add the atmosphere that the person who's interpreting these words puts into the background of of the play uh, puts into the scenery of the play puts into the costumes and then the people who are living this out they understand those words and they've memorized them so in a waldorf school we don't read to the children we speak it from memory we memorize it by heart and so if it's not by heart what is it it's by mind mm -hmm. uh, excuse me by brain and the brain is a mirror image of reality, it's not reality at all. And so when you have a concept, beyond a shadow of a doubt, your concept is not the same as the percept that might have stimulated the concept. And so the second that you see something and you go, oh, that's a tree, I understand what a tree is, and then you don't look any further, well, had you looked further, you'd see that it was a ginkgo tree. And had you done some research, you'd know that ginkgos were around in a massive prehistory time when the when the dinosaurs were around. Right. And then you'd find out that G Ginkgo Balboa will actually increase your memory capacity. And then you find out that the bark of the Ginkgo tree, and the, see what I'm saying? If you could understand the speech of nature or the speech of another human being, which is the speech of nature also, you would get so much more than what you would find in the printed okay. word. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure I'm with you on this one, but anyway, uh, because I've seen your library. So you read books. <laughs> yes, so but you read I read lots of books. But I say the words as I read it in my oh, head. Really? Now, I am a speed reader, and <laughs> I used to speed read incredibly fast. That's not good, because I thought I understood it, but I didn't get to hear the echo, because you, what you really understand in life is what happens to you at night in your dreams as you digest what it is that you experienced in the day. And so when you read a book, 
like I just finished reading this great book I was telling you about, Arthur, right? It's like a five, 600 page book. It will take about a week for me to resound those things, which um, by the way, I nowadays I read word for word and I sound it in my brain. I don't just look for the meaning because if you're just looking for meaning, that's very luciferic. I'm looking for application. What in that book can I take into my life that changes me that I can then apply by sharing it with others? And that's what everything I do I was now always is. criticized because I sounded out words when I read. Um, and uh, that works better in engineering. But <clears throat> um, okay, so maybe we're off topic. I don't know. But uh, in terms of <clears throat> a person who has just experienced a very violent video game where in the realm of 10 or 15 minutes, they may have killed uh, with different weapons that they pull off their back and uh, and they went out and bought some more life. That's another interesting thing about these games. You lose life or, and I'm wondering if that is more than just metaphorical that in fact, are these people losing their humanity in, in the percentage of life going down to the point where they die on the screen? Uh, but then they get it back again. So there seem to be a bunch of issues related to demon possession here. So I want to ask you specifically, at what point, let's say uh, a child sits there and kills 20, 20 different demons or, or people uh, in, the, in the video game, has that child willfully invited a demon into their lives? Yes. Life? Yikes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any video game where you're killing people, any movie from Hollywood where people are getting killed, and that's the reason that I dislike actors and actresses so much, especially the ones who are in violent movies, because then they come out and try, they try to tell us, uh, you know, to be their uh, social justice yeah, warriors. Virtue, virtue signalers, signalers. Absolutely. And a, lot of, a lot of kids look up to that. They, they're sort of envious of that. I mean, all you have to do is look at what's offered on Netflix and what I'd say 70% of them have a gun in the picture advertising it. And so you're basically, you're saying, oh, your idol, your Hollywood star is a murderer and is teaching you to be a murderer and teaching you to have no conscience as you do this and is sucking you in through luciferic flashing of light and through basically a lie because all movies are nothing but lies in almost all cases, unless they're a documentary, they're just lies. That's all. They're really well-crafted Luciferic lies. But if they are killing people, then it goes into the realm of satanic worship. Now worship is what you do every day. So if you play video games all day, that's what you worship. If you do nothing but watch bad movies all day, that's your God. That's who you're worshiping. And uh, sorry, but that's not God. Now, God has everything to do with the I am, with the sacredness of the other person. And you really can't even know who you are unless you get the reflection back from a person outside of yourself. You cannot be a monk and go into silence. I know this. I tried it. You can't be a hermit and have any spiritual advancement. All you can do is stop your bad habits. The only way you're going to have any spiritual advancement is to have your eye reflected in another person's eye and it comes back to you. And then you go, oh, that person's telling me I did a good thing by, you know, this charitable deed I did or Can so on and back? so forth. I, I, I missed something in your last point uh, about spiritual advancement and being a monk. What, were you, what was your point there? Well, in Tibetan Buddhism, it clearly states, and Tibetan Buddhism, of course, is not Christian, but it does have a very good, clear mental path for developing yourself. A monk cannot attain enlightenment in one incarnation. They, the, if they're a monk, they can't attain enlightenment in that incarnation. The only person that can attain enlightenment in one incarnation, in a specific incarnation, is a householder, a person who has given love to their spouse, created children, given love to them, and given love to the community. It's the only way. It's the only way. You can't That's do it any other way. Most people see the monastic life as... The opposite of that, that, that gives them an easier path to uh, enlightenment. Basically, they're running in place. They're not mm -hmm. going anywhere. But if they were evil to begin with, 
then it's a good chance for them to reflect upon all the bad things they did to people yeah, and try I to. Think that's why a lot of people become monks. They're trying to work out their salvation. I was a monk, and some of the monks were murderers. Hmm. And then the uh, the abbot of the monastery didn't you know that. You obviously didn't know that, right? At the time I knew that. Started... I could see it by looking at them. Yes. Oh, I see. Okay. And so, unfortunately, there are many priests. It's it's like whatever your profession is, that's usually your problem. So if you're a doctor, or let's say you're a psychiatrist, then you're probably crazy. And if you're not crazy, then you've driven your wife crazy uh, or your children crazy, and then you give them crazy drugs. You give them psychotropic drugs. And what is that all about? That's because, or like a, a policeman, I'm sorry to have to say it, but certainly the majority, I'll, I'll, I'll be nice, and I'll say the majority of policemen have problems with dominance and violence. Now, they may tell you that they're trying to stop the violence of others upon innocent people, but when they do, they are the dominant one, and they're using violence to stop them. So usually, whatever you choose as your profession or whatever it is you dislike is who you are. And, and a so, lot of times you've spent a lot of time working things out, so you're more aware of the circumstances in a particular profession because you're working them out in yourself. So, okay, you use psychiatrist. I get that. You use civil engineer, for example. How how am I working out something in civil engineering? Because I, I don't see that. Well, you want to be important. Obviously, you want to build things. You want to build oh things gosh. that last. Let me answer that question for you, Michael. It would have taken a civil engineer and a Christian civil engineer, a moral Christian civil engineer, to have figured out the corruptness of the world, because that's what you do as a civil engineer. You're looking for the faults and the foundation that are going to make the whole thing collapse. And you and your miners get in there, and that's what you've done. The other thing is I know from our discussions, you have always wanted to bring peace to the world. You wanted people to communicate with each other. You mm -hmm. wanted truth to prevail. Well, then you had to invent this thing called social media network, which was taken by the evil ones, but you never stopped your fight. And in fact, you have a new product coming out very soon that like puts an electronic fence around your house where they have the backdoor keys to it. Oh, I, I think your story is remarkable. Almost as much as well. Douglas's. Okay, so so uh, Douglas's illustration was a lot of times people. Um, and by the way, thank you for those kind words. Um, that a lot of times you choose a profession because that's the problem you're working out. And um, I, I never saw my interest in civil engineering as a problem I was working out because I think I can't build a bridge unless I'm in a construction company with. A lot of cash. But and... our government is a structure. It may they have buildings, but they also have an infrastructure that had to be examined by someone with the training of a civil engineer. Yeah, yeah I, I can see that. Mm -hmm. For instance, your impulse to create social media was, as Tyler just mentioned, to help people communicate across the world through a platform that would speed it up that would make sure that communications were reached, that it was scalable, it could reach all kinds of people. So you take the good message and you send it out. Okay, that was your original impulse. What happened? Yep. The demons got a hold of it and the demons who you know were in, inside of Professor Chandler and uh, General Freeze and all these people. And what did they want to do with it? Control and manipulate. Weaponize it. Weaponize it and literally weaponize it to use it as a tool to target and attack others. And that's Correct. what it has been turned into. And mm -hmm. so we now live in an age when no one has a conscience. Well, most people no longer have a conscience. Why? Because they're told by their video games, they're told by the mainstream media, they're told by their politicians, it's okay. Everybody's doing this evil. Everybody's telling this white lie. Right. Everybody's telling this very horrible lie. And it's okay then because I see that this society is doing that. Why? Because this is the realm of the devil. This isn't heaven. You can see heaven here. You can either see heaven or you can see hell. That's up to you. But the realm of death is not the realm of life, the realm of Christ, the realm of God. No, it's quite different. And okay, that's so let's, realm. let's take a child who has spent 10, 5, 10 years in gaming and has 
killed probably more than a thousand characters on these games and then they walk into the workplace um and you're saying that if they have willingly chosen to play that game they have a demon relative to whatever sin that they were observing on the screen is that correct yes but their original sin was only initial after that it became a habit and once the habit happens it's no longer them doing it it's subnatural okay so they walk demons. into it uh, they're they're confronted with something in the workplace and so they have a choice they can do the right thing or the wrong thing and what i see your main point here is that whenever you choose to do the wrong thing you've upped the game on this layering of sin and once you choose another sin on top of the previous layered sin you then walk into a world of fantasy and you don't even know what's right and wrong. And that's, to me, what's going on in our culture. Yes. It's like the person who uh, works all day, comes home and drinks a six pack, six pack. What are they doing? Diminution of consciousness. It's a depressant. They think they're getting high. They, they think they get a buzz. Absolutely medically incorrect. They are depressing themselves. They're stopping their memory capacity. They are uh, dulling down their conscience and they are dimming their consciousness. And so alcohol, as well as uh, tobacco, as well as sugar. Sugar is a luciferic drug. It makes you think that you're happy and high for a minute. What happens later? 20 minutes later, your liver crashes. Whoa. What? Sugar is comes from a cane out in the fields. How did it become luciferic? At it what was, point? It was denatured. All sugar has been dyed. It's been bleached. Same thing with salt. It has the, uh, the good part of salt is uh, one of the best parts is iodine. They take the iodine out and they put bad iodine in. Well, so that iodine was added by a human being. Correct. It doesn't exist. Well, I guess it does. Some of the ancient salts had iodine in them. Oh, uh, normal sea salt has iodine, okay. uh, a good amount of it, as a matter of fact, especially if you get uh, sun-dried Celtic sea salt or if you get Himalayan salt, it's got a lot of it in it. But the point is, is if you take flour and you denature it and you remove the germ, the, the wheat germ from flour, mm -hmm. you've taken out the best part. If you take wheat germ and you ferment it, it creates a substance which they call... Um, well, it's, it's, it's actually a drug that they use now. And for a while, it was the best drug for cancer, and then they stopped it. But basically, if you take substances as they are in nature, like sugarcane, uh, and you just eat pure sugarcane, that will rot your teeth out. If you go to the Caribbean, where they grow a lot of sugarcane, you'll see that the people's teeth are rotting out of their head because they mm -hmm. just take it raw and they eat it. So that's even that's not denatured and that's not uh, highly uh, 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 goes through all pro kinds of processes of denaturing and uh, high um, production, basically evils. Uh, but you can also take honey, okay? Well, you can take honey, but if you cook it, it's no longer honey. And so if you take things in their natural substance, uh, in their natural form, then things are fine. Okay. But it, if you denature them, then it's a real problem. I, I got a soft topic. Sorry. Uh, let's go back to, uh, if you would. Um, how, so a person who has just been confronted, maybe they didn't even know that this TV show was going to show violence and, and was going to show people getting murdered. What are they supposed to do? Uh, short of just not watching any TV, uh, to uh, somehow protect themselves from the uh, from inviting a demon into their lives. Well, that's problematic. And uh, can you see that? Could you, as a, as a clairvoyant person, see that demon enter? Oh, absolutely. If you stand outside of a room look, watching people watch the old televisions with the cathode ray tube, you could literally see the demons going in and out of their eyes and ears and their right. body and sucking their will right away what, from them. What did that demon look like? Black spiders, flying black winged creatures, uh, creatures that are chewing on your metabolic system, black demonic 
from below the earth coming up to do that. Um, you, you would rock in a room and see that? Yes. Oh, wow. That's why I hated TVs and I destroyed every one that I could. Hmm. And I didn't watch TV for decades and decades. And I was a Waldorf teacher. We didn't allow the children to watch TV. We well, didn't allow made, them to go to movies. You made a distinction of cathode ray tube versus the LCDs that we have now. Is there a difference? It's just a different way of presenting the pixels. Well, no, you have actually, uh, you have an ion stream coming right through the screen of the TV in the old days that would literally go in and hypnotize you and right. entrance you. Electrons coming in, hitting you, the yeah. phosphorus on the back of the screen and then projecting some light. If you were within 10 feet of the television, you were going blind and it was basically stripping the melatonin from your pineal gland, especially if you're watching TV at night, which is what people do or watch TV in a dark room, it strips melatonin from your pineal gland, which is the master timing gland uh, for your growth, for your aging, for your size, er all of that. So you are harming your ductless glands when you are being exposed to radiation. Well, every computer has all kinds of radiation, but it's not as specific because they use light emitting diodes. They use these different types of screens. So now what do they do? They just make sure that the frequency bombardment is so intense that you can't, you can't cognize it. Okay. You cannot cognize what's going into your brain from a movie. You cannot. When you, mean, when you say cognize, you mean recognize? No, I mean thinking. You cannot analyze and think it through and say, oh, that's fake. Oh, if you move the camera back a little bit, you'll actually see power lines. Oh, this and that. You're not going to do any of that. You're going to surrender. Now, this is the key factor. Anytime you meet a human being, because we're human and we have not evolved to become angels, Rudolf Steiner points out and other people point this out. The first thing you do when they start to speak is go dead asleep, ignore them and probably hate them. It literally takes the a conscious demon. No, your own human nature. You're, hey, you're... Uh, wait, I missed something. So uh, can you back up? What, what is it you're talking about here now? The, a demon attacking a human being or what? We're talking about human nature, and in the while you're in the human body, you're going to have a dual experience that you are both spirit and material. If you believe you're just material, then you're lost, and mm -hmm. you will definitely be nothing but a target for demons of all sorts. But when you speak to another person, when your I am, your ego, speaks to another person, and then they speak back, you automatically go to sleep. You don't want to listen to them. That's human nature. As a matter of fact, when they start speaking, nowadays, people have so little tolerance <laughs> that, that they will cancel you because you said one wrong pronoun or you looked a certain way or you had a hat on they didn't like or that you have your skin color is not what they like. So nowadays, because we're taught this in all the movies, nothing is more racist than movies. Nothing is more um, evil and nothing is more uh, demanding that you answer to your father, Satan, who is the ruler of this world. You have to consciously rise above that into the realm of the Father God through Christ that you can then enter into heaven. And then when you're hearing someone speak, you have true human interest and you truly listen. You don't just hear, you listen. You know how rare that is? It's considered to be the rarest of human qualities on the earth right now. Even more rare than patience is tolerance. And so the first thing we do when someone starts speaking, unless they're a good buddy and you, know, and you already accept them, if it's somebody you don't know, you're going to try to categorize them. You're going to try to pinhole them. You're going to put them in a box. You're going to say, oh, they're that, and I'm going to write them off as soon as I can. That is killing them. As, as Christ said, just the thought alone is a sin. You don't have to even act upon it. The fact that you even thought that evil thought yeah, about another person. The, the COVID nonsense and the way there was such judgmentalism for somebody who didn't wear a mask or get the back. And what was that? That was fear, doubt, and hatred. That's what you meet when you get to the threshold between the material world and the spiritual world is you have to face those demons. 
Well, those demons are constantly telling you to do bad. So when you go to a video game or you go to a movie and you're and you're killing people in the video game or you're watching these uh, superstars, these superheroes kill people left and right without any compunction, without any morality, without any conscience, every single time you experience that, unless you can stand back like you do when you read and you say the words inside and then you let them echo and then for three days you let that echoing come back to you so that then it arises out of your own self if you can't do that with a movie or a video game it goes in and it possesses you now who created those video games that was the demonic work of people who have fallen into the elemental realm and that's what your computer is it's a demon box it is well, filled it with elementals the, those games are created by programmers who storyboard storyboard it all out and then they write code to put the images on the screen in a certain way and then they've got other code that that uh, tracks all that so these are human beings who program it so are those the 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 uh, and they get paid for that uh, are they demonic those are the tools of Satan Yes, if you're creating a video game where you are having guns shoot people, whether you not like it or not, you're complicit with pure evil because you are hypnotizing other people into being dumbed down, to being numbed, to being completely put asleep so that killing is okay. And that's why we have wars. That's why we can't get along with our neighbors. That's why one country can't get along with another country because they simply are not having... They're not following the rule of Christ, which is to love God with all your heart and love your neighbors yourself. They're not doing that. Right. Okay. So all of these things, and now you might think, well, but wait, all I do is I surf the net and that's okay. No, hello. What are you talking about? Are you on Facebook? <laughs> if you're on Facebook, whether you like it or not, over in the corner, there's uh, semi and fully naked women completely doing uh, things that the whore of Babylon would do. These are prostitutes. These are prostitutes of violence, of sex, of the desire for mammon, for money. So who, what, what? Lust is Asmodeus. Uh, Lilith is the other one. And Lilith, Lilith. is another one. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, these are the demons of lust, the demons of desire, the demons of um, avarice, the demons of hatred, of demons of fear. So anytime that you are being pulled into that and you say, well, it's okay because everybody else does it, or it's okay because I'm above that. I don't it's do that. It's just a movie. It's just a movie. No, it's not. It is what you worship. It is who you are. No it one is... uses the word worship when they're watching TV. Well, right? sorry, they're incorrect. Everything you do with your willpower, conscious or unconscious, is your religion. Hmm. It's what you believe in. It's what you worship. It's what you wish to become. And unfortunately, yes, with the superhero movies, let's take them for example, when you see these superheroes, you know that you have those superhuman capacities in yourself for good, but the ones for bad, you don't want. So what are you actually looking at? You're looking at your future. You're looking at the beings of um, Venus, uh, Mercury, and Vulcan who are coming to us in our age and trying to inspire us but in fact, we're being pulled down into the ancient demons that are in the realm of Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, which are below the earth. And so you are either being pulled down into the earth or being pulled above the earth. The only right place to be is in the middle where you are cognizant of the fact that you are a perfect 3D holographic image of God and the cosmos and that you need to use that to let the love of God in the cosmos flow through you to help other people without ever expecting any reward for giving that love out. And that is not what happens in a video game. That is not what happens in a movie. As a matter of fact, we used to have to do this because some of the time the children in the Waldorf school would come in and they had gone over to their friend's house and they saw a movie, right? Well, they didn't usually see movies. I could see, I would greet them at the door and shake their hand before they'd come into the classroom. And I could see, I'd look at them and go, okay, you saw a, real, a strange movie that bothered you over the weekend? And they'd say, 
Yes, and then they go, eh, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened, this and this happened, right. and what right. are they doing? They're saying, I can't digest it. Please, as my teacher, help me digest this evil that I don't usually experience, but I saw this evil television show or a movie or a video game, and I don't know how to digest it. Why? You can't digest it. You can't digest it. You can't digest the elemental presence. So how did you help demons. that student in that case with that example? What did I would you have do to, with them? I would go see the movie, come back and try to diffuse it by saying, well, you do understand that, that for instance, with Jaws, when people saw Jaws, they saw sharks, they'd be driving in the car and they'd see a shark, shark in front of them open its mouth to eat them. This was so common. And, and it just shows you that when they do those that type of uh, movie production that it's so real to people that it, it never leaves their subconscious. And so mm -hmm. people had to be told, no, there are not sharks big enough to eat your car and you, there's no sharks. We're not anywhere near the ocean. And by the way, the shark attacks in America are only this very small amount. And that was a bad movie. That was in fact, a model of a shark. It wasn't real. Douglas, so but recently you have uh, looked at the movie, the, the recent Exorcist movie, and have cautioned people from watching that. Yes, the Pope's Exorcist. And why? First off, because it's all lies. It's all nonsense. And the man that they're writing the story about was pure evil. He was the Pope's Exorcist, but he really wasn't an exorcist. He did what 60,000 exorcisms and was only effective in, in a, very, a handful of cases. And many of the times, even the woman that they show in that movie, she was never healed. And uh, she, she had nine exorcisms done by uh, Father Gabrielli, and it never healed her because he thinks he can cast out demons. No one can cast out demons except Christ through the Father God and the Holy Spirit period. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as a ghostbuster. There's no such thing as a priest who can, you know, do a little exorcism ceremony during your, uh, during the Holy Eucharist or during your church service. And that's going to help you. And that's not going to help you. You need to consciously understand how these things work, how they go into you and how you can guard against them. But if you think you have the power to go and watch, um, let's see the John Wick as I mentioned, or any of these movies where there's a lot of violence, if you think that your conscience is so highly developed and your consciousness is so highly developed that you can abnegate the hypnotic effect of that that turns you into an animal, you are incorrect. Well, I think that's what pe most people think. They think they can handle it. Um, so so with, with, with this... Uh, a, we're confronted with these images, these stories, these these uh, 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 fantasies. We're watching actors and actresses who are playing a part, and therefore, I guess from your point of view, lying. Um, <clears throat> and that's gone back into millennia. That was called the theater, uh, and so we've accepted, and we we charge interest, we pay interest. And it seems like you're defining that the seven deadly sins all give uh, our, we are confronted with each one of those, uh, maybe on a daily basis. And then the real key is our reaction to them. That's what you're saying, right? Yes. Okay. So then it, we've got to basically um, uh, dissemble what it is we're seeing in order to address it. Is that what you're saying? Yes. And why go through all the trouble to watch it and dissemble it? We just don't watch it. Mm -hmm. For instance, in the Greek theater where catharsis was a healing force, nobody was acting. They put on a face. If I was happy, I put on the face, the mask of happiness. If I was sad, I put on the mask. And the audience could say, oh, the actor isn't lying to us. The actor is trying to show us through the mask that they wear that the storyline is being delivered. Uh, for instance, Antigone, which is about the, the humanities becoming the Furies because she went out and, and buried, because a person buried the body of somebody when they weren't supposed to at the, raw, at the improper time. So what is that? That is a catharsis. Drama can be one of the greatest things 
for advancing your conscience consciousness. But nowadays, it, in those days, it was obvious you willingly suspended your disbelief and you believed that the mask that was being put over the face of the person represented sadness, happiness, gloom, whatever. And so you knew the difference. Nowadays, you cannot willingly suspend your disbelief with the movies. You can't tell what's real. You right. can't tell if these monsters are real. So therefore, you watch a movie that's just filled with a bunch of monsters and demons. You're not going to get rid of that. That's not going to leave your subconscious. Not unless you are a really highly developed person, which is uh, very few of us. Very, very, very few mm -hmm. of us. So you have to be careful of that. That's the reason in Waldorf School, uh, even today in Germany, if you go into Waldorf School, you have to sign a document saying your child will not watch television the entire time that they are in the Waldorf School or go to movies hmm. or so, play video games. So on an individual level, you're saying we've got to become discerning. we got to use discernment. We've got to stay away from uh, so, these influences that can cause us to to fall. And, and I don't think you're saying all encounters with those sins are result in a demon coming into our lives are you or are you i'm saying they're created by demons and the more you give over to it the more you no longer have a willpower to resist it hmm. so you're saying the very first one uh is enough to get you into a realm where you're being influenced by a demon is that demon then uh, going to try to reinforce their influence on you with additional temptation? Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you do it consciously, which many people have made pacts with the devil, you sign in your blood because your blood is where your I am is. And the reason that all the killing happens is because most of us want to have power and control. And strangely enough, that leads to domination. And if you kill somebody, you dominate them. And if you kill somebody, then you think you're God because you just took away a God-given life. And so people who do these things are, in fact, they, first they're initially invited by the demons, and then later they are actually asking the demons to come in and possess them because they like what they're doing. And that's a very sad scenario. And unfortunately, when you use your telephone, you don't realize that you're playing God. You don't realize that you think you're omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. But that's what the phone convinces you. That's the Luciferic delusion. And then the harmonic device, which is the millions of hours of the programmers who've written those things, which we give no credit whatsoever to any of them. The child with the yeah, you do. The, the child with the phone has no consciousness whatsoever that they don't True. deserve that device. Because that True. device is more powerful. Matter of fact, in the school, when phones came in, they became a weapon of destruction. And there have been more children who have committed suicide because they were shamed on social media than you can uh, even count. And well, nowadays, they, they basically say 75% of all children using cell phones and computers are depressed and they're headed towards suicidal ideation. So parents today, the ones that are trying to uh, do the right thing with their children, uh, you hear a lot of them talking about screen time and limiting screens. So you get a you get an hour of screens a night or a day or every other day, whatever. Um, is that a move in the right direction for those parents? As long as you're going towards zero, yes. <laughs> But mm -hmm. if you think that just... Uh, no, it's not zero. It's like, okay, one hour a day, and then you have to fight them to get them off of it. And they're obsessed. It's just notice. Uh, I say this to everyone. Yeah, you can tell. Walk up to anybody, grab their phone, and play like you're going to throw it in the lake. That person will kill you. They will beat you to death. They won't even think. You just took their life. You just took their I am. That's how they know who they are. Then they believe that because they have a social network, that those are human beings chiming in to let them know who they are, because that's the only way you find out who you are is by interacting with other people. But those are all lies. 
Well, children, children don't have enough discernment to stop that. So if they get an opportunity to use a, a, a device like an iPad or a phone, they're going to use it until somebody stops them from using it. It, it you're, tr you're right. It is like a drug and the parents are trying to control the drug without taking them off cold turkey. That seems to be what most of the conscientious parents are trying to do. And you're saying that's not enough. It's not enough. In Montessori schools, they have things called the works. And these are devices that might be um, gradations of blocks that stack up on something or, or of rings that stack up. And basically it's teaching spatial awareness and these kind of things. So they have watched them. And these studies are quite conclusive that a child given a one of those kind of devices will do it 26 times. And at the end, they've mastered it after 26 times. They put it aside. They go to the next level. That's not what happens with a video game. There's no end to the amount of involvement that it takes to play. Some video games take years to actually get the ultimate goal and win the goal. And then what do you do when you're done? You brag to your other people around the world that you're playing the video game with who you've never met. You don't even know if they're human. You don't know whether they're male or female. You don't know anything about them. And certainly they do not care about you and you do not care about them. And that's who you're bragging to that you reach the ultimate level of uh, some war game that you're playing by murdering people. This is sick and demented. This is truly evil. And it basically makes you completely callous to other human beings so that you can't see them. You can't hear them. You can't feel them. And you don't want to interact with them. And that's basically the asocial results of these kind of video games and okay, television me, shows. Let me ask you uh, for your qualifications here. How many students have you been the principal of in your career? <laughs> you must be kidding. Uh, yeah, give me a number. Hundreds of thousands. Okay. So I always had 10,000 students a year. I was the superintendent of 10,000 students a year for 12 years. That's 120,000. And then I've taught, you know, for decades and decades. And I taught all students in the school. So, because I was the principal, so I would have lessons to teach all of them. So at one point I had uh, 24 schools and those schools had like 500 students each. So I don't, I can't calculate. So uh, and from a standpoint of uh, demons, could you see the demons interacting with these students on a daily basis? Absolutely. And you could tell what the student was watching a lot of television. Yes. And what would you do? What, how would you help them? Would you talk to the parents about changing the changing up their schedule? Yes, or not? absolutely. Okay. In those days, nowadays, all that has fallen to the wayside and it's, it's a given that it's okay. Right. They that, give out iPads in most of these, Totally. Elementary schools. The, matter of fact, at one point they wanted to stop schools and just give the child a computer with all knowledge on it, and the mm -hmm. child could walk through it at their own speed. And you know that's how actually some of these students that you've seen recently in the news, who are twelve years old and they have already gone to college and have multiple degrees. Why? Because they all did it on a computer, and the computer is not learning. Matter of fact, here's the deal: we did very advanced studies. Uh, with these. We were some of the first um, schools to do this because we had to work with adjudicated youth who needed to catch up. And so what we found out is the following. The lower your IQ, the more you want to be engaged with a computer for learning. The higher your IQ, the more difficulty you're going to have engaging with it. Hmm. Wow. Okay. So what would what, what's your message to the average parent who's trying to do the right thing uh, probably has limited screen time, but still allows it on a daily basis. Pro most of them I know uh, say, okay, an hour a day, that's it. Then you got to turn it in. Put well, first down. off, because of the pandemic, most of school, uh, like my children who are in college, 75% of it is online. And now it's all, you know, it's gone to that. It's now the standard. Everything's online. I took online courses at the Phoenix University to do my EDD and it drove me insane and I hated it and I'll never do it again. Because why? There was no human interaction. It was an excuse for human interaction. And right. basically it makes the human into a machine and you pay more attention to machine language, machine intelligence, 
than human intelligence. And there's no warmth in a machine. Remember, this computer I'm touching, it's always cold. And the light that's in it is inside of the black box. And you can't see the light. Well, this is the delusion that, in fact, what's coming up on that screen is real because it's not real. All you have to do is get a virus and you'll find out that your computer is worthless. You know. And well, that's it. You and I are talking. And uh, I know that's not you. I can't touch you. But I, I know I'm interacting with a human being. Is that the same or different than what you just said? Because we know each other. We've met in person. It's quite different. This is now basically um, simply a communication line. I can close my eyes and I can still have communication with you because I know your voice. I know your heart. I know your thinking. But if you are brand new to me, like I just met somebody online, I don't know really anything about that person. Anything that person tells me may or may not be true. And will I actually become that person's friend? Only if I ask about his wife and his children, only if I ask about his biography, only if I'm actually truly listening to the questions that this person might be bringing. And then I have to be thankful to, I need to be thankful for every single programmer that ever wrote code that created the possibility for us to stop, talk here on, on this uh, live stream. Or I have to thank Lucifer for basically bringing these images for me. I have to thank Araman for putting together the micro circuits that run this computer. I have to thank the beings involved. And that's what it's all about. It's about consciousness. If you can have that consciousness, which I've said, very few, you know, very small okay, percentage of people have that. Second. Whoa. You're saying I have to thank the demons? Yes. Or else they'll come in and take over. I need to keep those demons at bay and say, thank you, demons. Get ye behind me. Thank mm -hmm. you, Lucifer. Stay in your place. Christ is your, uh, is, is actually the person, is the being who can control you. But they don't, neither Lucifer nor Araman, Satan, know anymore that Christ exists. They don't understand that Christ came to the earth, that Christ came from the heavens to the earth to teach us the model that we're supposed to follow. And what is that? That's not because I read it in a book. It's not because I saw it in a movie, uh, though I've watched, you know, quite a few movies and not because I listened to the album Jesus Christ Superstar. No, it's because I had a direct experience of Christ. In other words, I can see Christ in others. I can see Christ in me. I can see that being interacting. I can see that being growing. That is not what you find in a book or a movie. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, it sounds like uh, we've got our work cut out for us because I would say, in my understanding, most churches don't address this issue at all. Uh, maybe they do screen time discussions and parents who are trying to figure out how to manage this uh, have gotten that far. But this issue of, uh, let, me, let me ask you again. I see a violent act, somebody murdered on TV. Me, Mike McKibben, what should I do at that moment? Go back and abnegate any part that you thought was real. Dissect it so you know that, uh, you know, that wasn't real blood that there weren't real bullets, and that this is just a stupid Hollywood gimmick to try to pull you in to sell you more stuff. Mm -hmm. And once you understand that, you can then set it aside. You can say, get you behind get me. Behind but me. Yeah. Until then, it's going... And, and don't forget that the electromagnetic frequencies, we're not even talking about them. We're not talking about the fact that these devices emit poisonous rays, poisonous frequencies, and... Almost every single person in the world is sensitive to electromagnetic frequency and it creates illness in every person. So we have to awaken, get our feet on the ground, get grounded, go out and absorb the sun, realize that all life comes from the sun, warmth, light, sound, life, everything comes from the sun. There's nothing on the earth that didn't come from the sun. And yet, how many times do you thank the sun a day? How many times do you thank the starry heaven above that creates the cosmos that's a reflection of our thinking capacity. How many times do we thank our neighbor for being Christ in them to show us Christ in us? So we you're saying need to look work on that. 
thankfulness is a big step in the right direction. Yes, thankfulness and gratitude are in love are some of the most powerful forces on the face of the earth. So you can thank a demon. I can work with a demon. I've worked with lots of demons. <laughs> and I, had, I have read that in, in the history of the uh, patristic history where, where um, very holy people have, have dealt with demons in certain ways, even got them to do work for them. Oh, definitely. St. Jerome, St. Stephen, all these had demons who were hounding them. And in the end, they thanked the demons because it showed them their temporal nature, the fact that they're going to die and that they need to prepare for that. The fact that this world is not the realm of the Father God. It's not the realm where Christ lives. Christ now lives in the etheric realm. He only once incarnated in the physical. And then what do they do to Christ, you know? Uh, that is what they will do to your ego. That's what people will naturally do based upon their human condition, their human common condition. And so we just need to be thankful and we need to keep focused on the right thing. You have to keep your eye on the golden ring. You have to keep your eye on your own ascending I am that is leaving this world appreciative of what this world can teach us about universal law appreciative of the fact that human beings do embody Christ, but who can see Christ in the other? When you can, that's a billion times better than the best superhero movie that you can watch from Hollywood. Well, we're at, uh, we went way over here. Um, I, I need to stop, but I, I didn't even get to the second half of this on the macro level, how, how our cultures have been uh, attacked by demons and is that a separate group of demons or is it the same demons that are attacking us as individuals and uh, we'll deal with that next time yes because that's a great thing to focus on we focused on the individual now we need to focus on how the societal effects of the broad ranging demonic influences have basically taken over pretty much the whole world and what do we do about that that's the Big question. How do we fit into a society right. that literally worships Satan rather than worships their higher self or Christ We've got or some God. work to do, brother. Thanks yes, for your, do. thanks for sharing. Yes. And thank you so much. I know that people just love it when you uh, make sure that I don't just uh, dance on beyond the question. <laughs> so uh, thank you so <laughs> yeah. much, Michael. We will Talk chat again soon. soon and uh, we'll continue these conversations okay. as soon as we have a possible chance to do so. God thank bless you. you. God bless you.